I'm going to go ahead and introduce Julia. Julia is the Community Science Outreach Naturalist serving Vermont Center for Eco Studies through Eco AmeriCorps. Julia connects with Vermonters interested in contributing to various community science projects, such as the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, with a specific focus on the use of iNaturalist, Vermont eBird, and eButterfly. So we are very excited to learn about lady beetles tonight with Julia. And I think that's that's all for me, Julia. You take it away. All righty. <clears throat> so before I begin, um, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies is located on El Nu Abenaki land. And I also want to name the fact that doing land acknowledgements by themselves is not enough and all of us need to be actively incorporating steps beyond land acknowledgements into our work and individual lives. So my presentation today is on the Lady Beetles of Vermont, Invasions, Extirpations, and Discoveries. What do you think of when you think of a ladybug, also known as a lady beetle? Do you think of an image that looks like the one you see on the screen, a small, relatively round beetle with red wing covers covered in black spots? Or do you think of, well, still small, relatively rounded beetles that come in a wide variety of appearances, some only a couple millimeters in length, up to over 10 millimeters in length, which is relatively around the size of a dime. And as you can see here, some even have hairs on them. <clears throat> you can also find lady beetles in their egg form, which are typically in small clusters, either on the underside of vegetation or along directly along the stems or branches of trees and shrubs. Some lady beetles, however, lay their eggs more individually, so you won't always find groupings such as this. You can also find them in their larval stage. They look quite a bit like small alligators, in my opinion. And you can find these, again, everywhere from grass in your backyard to the tops of trees. And finally, lady beetles, like many other insects, pupate when they transition from their larval form into their adult form. So you can also find them as these weird looking pupa. So lady beetles are very important to all of the ecosystems they exist in, which is a lot of ecosystems. You can essentially find lady beetles in every ecosystem found across North America from forests to grasslands to farmlands, even in marshes and at the top of mountains. Lady beetles are extremely important as a biological check for small insects such as aphids, mealybugs, and scale insects, which many lady beetle species eat. Without our native lady beetle species, our ecosystems may become imbalanced we may have too many of those small soft-bodied insects, which could cause damage both to our native ecological communities as well as to our croplands. Additionally, lady beetles are one of the most um, widely recognizable and well-loved invertebrate groups and are extremely sensitive to environmental conditions. So they have been proposed as an indicator species group. Finally, there are around 475 different species of lady beetle across North America alone. So they're an extremely diverse group of insects. And with that, they have a very wide diversification of the small soft-bodied insects that they eat. <clears throat> across North America, many of our native lady beetle species have been in decline. Some of these declines have been thought to be caused by the introduction of non-native lady beetle species, such as the Asian lady beetle, which was that first beetle you saw on the first slide I had. Additionally, introduced diseases, land use change, and pesticide use have been indicated as potential causes for decline. That said, many researchers have really focused in on 
the introduction of non-native species and land use change as the primary causes. Let's now focus in a little bit more on Vermont. So in 2018, VAL, or the Vermont Atlas of Life, which is a subgroup within the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, digitized the historic document that you can see on the screen. This was a checklist of lady beetles found during a survey conducted both during and prior to 1976 in which that, or that was the year in which it was published. As we digitized this document, we recognized that we didn't have very much data on modern lady beetles, and it seemed like many species were missing. So after we digitized this document, we began searching across the state of Vermont to find other historic documents, and we also digitized preserved specimen collections from the University of Vermont, Middlebury, Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation, and the Fairbanks Museum, along with curating research grade observations from the Vermont Atlas of Life on iNaturalist. At this point, we came to the end of data in existence and still did not have very much data on the current status of lady beetles. However, we did gain a good look at the historic fauna of lady beetles in the state and found <clears throat> that they're, oop, that's supposed to be 36, not 35. We found a new lady beetle species here this year, but there are 36 native species of lady beetle in the state, along with seven introduced species. So that's 43 total, not 42, my apologies. And as of 2019, 13 of our native species were missing, and it appeared that many of them had been missing for over 40 years. Others seem to be following those national trends of decline, which I talked about. So we are curious, where, where did they go? Do they still exist here? And to give you a bit of a visualization as to what this data we've been collecting looks like, you can see here, this graphic shows a trend line of the number of lady beetle species recorded each year from 1874 all the way to 2021. And you can see that there's this large spike in the number of species recorded around 1976 when that survey was being conducted. And then you can see here, kind of from the 1980s on, there's a bit of a decline until um, iNaturalist kicked off and the Vermont Atlas of Life began in 2012. And then you can see that there's been a sharp increase since we've started the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, which I will talk about a little bit more momentarily. That said, it is a little bit suspicious that in the 1980s, we began to see some of these non-native species such as the Asian lady beetle, the 14 spotted lady beetle and the seven spotted lady beetle um, become established in Vermont. And that's around the same time that you see some of the native species that are still missing, um, which are the two spotted, the nine spotted and the transverse lady beetles. You see that the last observations of them kind of peter out around the same time that those non-native species really are becoming established. And just to note this trend line for the Asian lady beetle, uh, we actually have almost 2000 observations of it. Um, so this does not incorporate just how many of those beetles are being recorded. So all of this information we're finding about apparent declines, still having missing species, leads us to the Vermont lady beetle atlas. This project began in earnest in 2020 and uses a community science framework to search for lady beetles. And basically what that means is we are calling on naturalists across the state to go out and look for lady beetles and upload them to iNaturalist, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Um, so basically what we want to figure out is if the missing species 
which currently there are 10 species that we still have not located. If they are extirpated or extinct in the state of Vermont, or if they still exist in low numbers. And we also, from there, want to inform conservation initiatives that may need to be taken, which could look like native lady beetle reintroduction or determining ways to combat non-native species if that is the cause of decline in the state of Vermont. So this is another graphic that shows lady beetle observations over time. And you can see again here, this is just the total number of individuals observed. You can see this huge exponential growth that goes on from the start of iNaturalist in 2012 all the way through 2021. And basically the reason why we're using iNaturalist um, is because iNaturalist is a community naturalist platform that is totally open access. Anyone can use it. You just have to sign up with an email and then create a password. And iNaturalist essentially helps community naturalists engage with each other and engage with research and projects that are occurring in their local regions. Tapping into the incredible community naturalists in the state of Vermont and you know, also on the global scale has multiple benefits, including increased community engagement with research and conservation, increasing awareness for um, different conservation issues, reduction of cost for survey measures, and an increased chance of, in this case, finding lady beetles. So we are following the framework of other Vermont Atlas of Life projects that have been extremely successful, such as the Vermont Bumblebee Atlas and the Moth Atlas. And we are also basing this on community science frameworks from the Cornell Lost Ladybug Project, which led to the discovery of two spotted and nine spotted lady beetles in the state of New York, where those species were previously thought to be extinct. This slide is a little bit redundant, but again, uh, to engage with this project, all you need to do is download iNaturalist. And whenever you encounter a ladybug, you just have to take photographs of it. I'll go over some good measures for photographing lady beetles so they're identifiable at the end of the presentation. Um, upload your observations and they will get pulled into our Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas as long as they are observed within the state of Vermont. <clears throat> to show a representation of how powerful the framework of having an atlas project and then doing a bunch of outreach to naturalists across the state can be. I have a comparison between Vermont and New Hampshire for lady beetle observations on iNaturalist. You can see currently in total there are 3,197 research grade observations in the state of Vermont alone along with 30 different species and 674 different people who have observed lady beetles versus New Hampshire, which is much lower in all of those categories. <clears throat> and as you can see here, I made a note of how many of these research grade observations are of Asian lady beetles. And you can see in this chart that I created from just the year 2020, Asian lady beetles were by far the most commonly observed species. Um, and this can say a couple different things. First of all, Asian lady beetles are the species that you'll typically find in your house during the winter. And they're very much, since they're a non-native species here, uh, the way in which they've adapted to a new place was to become rather associated with humans. So you can find them in agricultural fields and you also find them in urban centers. So that might be one reason why they're being observed at such a higher rate than all of the other species. 
That said, the other reason may be that they're just much more populous than other species are at this point. A lot of times when I'm out, you know, even on Mount Mansfield doing surveys for lady beetles, I'll still find Asian lady beetles. And I found them in places that aren't particularly close to where there's a town or agricultural land. So I think that it may be a combination of both slight skewed survey bias, but also the fact that they are just a very numerous species. To begin talking a little bit about what we found so far. So this graphic that's moving through on the right-hand side of the screen was the change in the number of observations over time, just on iNaturalist. So in our pilot year of 2020, we saw an increase of 234 iNaturalist users contributing lady beetle data to iNaturalist for the first time. We doubled the total number of lady beetle observations, again, in iNaturalist in one year. Um, at the end of 2020, there were around 1,700 research grade lady beetle observations uploaded to iNaturalist and 914 of those were made in 2020, which was 54% of the total iNaturalist observations at that time. And last year we found one of the species that had been missing for several decades, which was the four-spotted spur leg lady beetle. <clears throat> In our second year of the Atlas, which is just winding down now, we had another 205 people contributing research grade lady beetle observations for the first time. And we yet again doubled the total number of lady beetle observations on iNaturalist, which is really exciting. We now have over 3,000 observations. And <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> many of those were from just this year. Which you can see on the screen. Now 43% of our total lady beetle data on iNaturalist has been from this past year, which indicates that our strategies of outreach have been relatively effective, which is very exciting. So a couple other findings. Community naturalists have rediscovered five species that have been lost for decades. These are the, this past year, um, somebody at VCE found a Hudsonian lady beetle. In 2020, the four spotted spur leg lady beetle, which you can see right here on the screen was rediscovered. And you kind of get an idea of how small some of these species are because this beetle is on someone's fingertip and it is tiny. In 2019, the 10 spotted spur leg lady beetle was rediscovered. Um, and then in 2017, both the convergent lady beetle and the hieroglyphic lady beetle were rediscovered. <coughs> Additionally, three new native species that were never previously recorded in the state of Vermont have been discovered. <coughs> These include the undoubtable lady beetle, the mountain lady beetle, and the disc marked lady beetle. So moving forward, we are rethinking how we are asking people to engage with this project. Last year, we encouraged people to adopt survey priority blocks and systematically look for lady beetles across a roughly three by three mile block. However, we didn't get any surveys back from people doing that and instead just got a bunch of uploads on iNaturalist from people either incidentally encountering a lady beetle or actively doing sweep net surveys wherever they were and uploading lady beetle observations from that. So in 2022, 
we are going to try leading walks with groups of naturalists in locations where missing species were most recently recorded and historically found. And we are also going to encourage people to visit those locations by themselves in whatever place is nearest to them instead of trying this more systematic block method. So a couple things, if you want to get involved with looking for lady beetles and uploading your findings to iNaturalist, that you want to think about are ensuring that your photos are identifiable. Again, since some of these species are very small, it can be really difficult to tell them apart from the other very small lady beetles that look essentially the same as them. So here's a couple tips. <clears throat> First, it's really helpful to bring a container with you. And if you find a lady beetle that's say crawling on a leaf in your garden, pop it into a clear container so you can photograph it in the container and then release it when you're done. It can also be helpful if you're actively out looking for them to bring an ice pack and a small cooler with you because then what you can do is put the lady beetle in the clear container and put the clear container on ice for a couple minutes. It doesn't hurt the lady beetle, it just slows them down a little bit so you can actually photograph them. Otherwise, they just run in circles around whatever they're in and can be extremely difficult to photograph. You also want to ensure that you are photographing multiple parts of the beetle. So you can see here, this is a 20 spotted lady beetle, one of our native species. I have a photograph of the underside of the beetle. The top of the beetle showing the wing covers or the electra here and the pronotum, that's the middle section of the lady beetle. And then I have one here showing the head and the front legs, even though they're a little bit blurry. Some of our small species have a spur on their front leg. They're the spur leg lady beetle group. And they look very similar to another genus of lady beetles, hyperaspis or the sigil lady beetles. So having photographs of their legs can be useful in telling those two genre apart. Additionally, it is very important that you have an accurate time, date, and location for your beetle survey because that is the information that is needed in order for iNaturalist to give you um, an observation that somebody else can identify and bring it up to research grade, which again, I'll talk more about at the end of the presentation. And I want to close out today by talking about a couple of our species that I really enjoy. <clears throat> so the first species that I want to talk about is the eye-spotted lady beetle. This is an arboreal species and is closely associated with conifers, specifically balsam fir trees, sorry. <coughs> I have a tickle. Um, these lady beetles are typically 7.3 to 10 millimeters in length and are a very important predator of the balsam twig aphid. There have been a couple studies that have shown how effective these beetles are at controlling populations of balsam twig aphids. For example, one study found that the eye spotted lady beetle reduced overwintering balsam fir aphids by around 30% and completely destroyed individual aphid colonies once they were located. Another really interesting thing about this species is they actually try to synchronize their life cycle with that of the balsam twig aphid so they can better utilize that food source. And it was found that they were much more effective at hunting balsam twig aphids than Asian lady beetles were. Another species of note is the convergent lady beetle. This is a habitat generalist and can be found anywhere from agricultural fields to meadows, forests, and gardens. That said, this species is extremely important for the health of our agricultural crops. 
They're around four to seven millimeters in length. And as you can see, they're much more oval or, uh, or yeah, oblong in shape than the eye spotted lady beetle, which is much rounder. Um, they can have one to two generations per year, depending on the climate, and then hibernate in groups under the leaf litter. <coughs> The final species I want to talk about tonight is the marsh lady beetle. This species is much smaller, only three to four millimeters in length, and is very elongate in form. Overall, lightish yellow, as you can see with black spots across the entire beetle. There isn't a whole lot known about this species other than the fact that they prefer low growing vegetation in wetlands, marshes, bogs, or meadows that have um, depressions that are very damp. So this is a nice species to look for because we don't know much about them and learning more about their habitat use and life cycle would just be helpful. So with that, um, I want to kind of close by saying that all of your lady beetle contributions along with any other taxonomic group that you are interested in is extremely helpful. And I really hope that you all download iNaturalist and want to participate in this project. I was thinking at this point, we can kind of turn this a little bit more into um, both questions and then maybe uh, if you could allow people to unmute themselves, then we could have a little bit more of a conversation. And if folks are interested, I can do a, a brief demonstration of how to use iNaturalist. Well, thank you so much, Julia. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really encouraging to see how many people were involved last year at, in um, submitting sightings of lady beetles. So congratulations to Vermont Center for Eco Studies for that. Um, we do have some questions here. So why I'm just thinking, does it make sense to start out with what we've got here? And then maybe you could do a little screen share and show folks how to use iNaturalist. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, yeah, why don't we start with that then? Um, does that sound good, Michael? I yeah, can uh, ask the first one here. What would you recommend as the best guides for identifying lady beetles? Oh, you're muted. Classic Zoom issue. Ah, uh, well, um, so there really aren't any great guides for lady beetles um, in Vermont. Oh, hold on. I need to get out of my screen share so I can pull up the link. But uh, we've put together a pretty extensive guide to the uh, native and non-native species that have been recorded in the state. And on the website, we have pictures of the beetle, um, identification, habitat, life history, um, and then a map showing where they've been found in the state. Um, so let me pull that up, but there also is a book by, or a PDF by Gordon, which is very comprehensive and is all of the lady beetle species that um, him and his collaborators found north of Mexico, but it is old and very technical. So I'll grab the Vermont Atlas of Life and pop it in the chat right now. Great, thank you. And just so everyone knows, I'll be sending out a follow-up email and I can include any links or information that Julia mentions tonight, including this guide and um, a link to iNaturalist, if that is helpful. Oh, yeah. So the next question is, um, I grew up hearing that the number of spots on a lady beetle indicated, quote, her age. Do they gain more spots as they age? Also, do males and females look the same? 
So it depends, <laughs> like many things. Um, I don't think that lady beetles actually develop more spots as they age. Rather, some of them actually fade over time. And some lady beetles, such as the eye spotted lady beetle that you saw earlier, um, they actually darken over time. So they'll go from having those here. I can share my screen and pull up the eye spotted lady beetle again. Um, let me just find it first. I think I have a easily accessible photo of the older one. Oh no, I don't. Maybe for the 15 spotted. But anyway, they actually end up losing their spots over time because they darken. Um, in terms of males and females looking different, a lot of times that won't be so much with the spots, but rather the pronotum, which again is the um, central segment of the beetle. This is the pronotum here where my cursor is. Um, and sometimes, depending on the genus, males will have a thin pale line in between a central patch on their pronotum and their head, whereas females won't have that line. But oftentimes their wing covers with the spots will be the same. That could vary for species that I'm unfamiliar with, but for the Vermont ones, that's really the only difference in terms of males and females. And then kind of last thing on that, there are some species that vary a lot in terms of their number of spots just on an individual to individual basis. So for example, the Asian lady beetle, you can actually find ones that have no spots at all on them. And that's not an age thing, that's just a very spotless beetle. But you can see here, this is, the, this is a young 15 spotted lady beetle. And you can very clearly see dark spots on kind of a grayish orange wing cover versus a much older individual that as you can see here, it's turning this like deep purple, which sometimes eventually becomes so dark that you can't see the spots at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a great photo comparison. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, next question here is, do they migrate? Some of them do. So there are a couple species that will go <coughs> up and down mountains. They'll overwinter at the top of the mountain, kind of under logs and rocks. And then in the summer, they'll migrate down into agricultural fields. And I think that's the five spotted lady beetle that does that, but I'm going to just fact check myself really quickly. Um, other species, their migration of the year isn't really a migration at all. They just emerge from where they overwinter, which again is either under leaf litter, under the bark, like loose bark of trees. Um, for the Asian lady beetle, they will overwinter a lot of times in people's houses. Um, and then in the spring, they'll emerge. But there are some species that will preferentially overwinter in the forest. And then in the spring and summer, we'll utilize crop fields if there are fields nearby, even if they're more of a forest species. In general, they're very mobile and just go to wherever the food is. Um, so you can, that's why agricultural crops can sometimes be a really good place to turn them up because if it's a monoculture, usually there's a higher pest load. So it just brings all the beetles to the town. And let's see. Yeah, uh, it is the five spotted lady beetle that um, migrates. They seem to hibernate at elevations between um, 1600 and uh, 3300 meters in the US and a little bit lower in Canada, aggregating at the same location each year. They overwinter on upper exposed slopes with sparse vegetation, aggregating under rocks, debris, and logs, and then apparently also at the base of juniper trees. And then they breed before dispersing to prairies, meadows, agricultural fields, and other regions. And their migration distance varies just depending on where they are and how far they feel like flying. Great, thanks. <laughs> 
So the next question is, did you send out uh, trainings on how to take research grade observations? Yes, so I can pop a couple references into the chat right now. Um, last year I did a series of videos that were very specifically focused on different aspects of iNaturalist use. Those are all recorded to VCE's Vimeo. Um, I'll grab the link once I'm done talking because I can't type and talk at the same time. Uh, so those are a good reference, as well as just the iNaturalist help page. And also once we get through questions, if folks wanna hang out for a couple more minutes, I'll pop onto iNaturalist and screen share and kind of talk about that more. But really all you need to do for research grade observations is have a photo or if it's not a beetle and something that like sings or chirps, you could have an audio recording. You upload that and then you make sure you have a date, a location, and as long as your photo or audio recording is identifiable, that. Once you upload it, you just need two thirds of the people who either agree or suggest a new identification to come to agreement with what the organism is and it becomes research grade. <clears throat> mm, thank you. I'm going to combine the next two questions. They are asked by the same person. So what do the still missing lady beetles look like and are they still present in neighboring states? Uh, some of them, yes. Others, it's hard to say. For example, the five spotted lady beetle, it's been <coughs> observed in recent years in a couple of the Canadian provinces that are just north of us. But it hasn't been recorded in Vermont since 1890. Um, and then there are a few other species that have been like the nine spotted and the two spotted lady beetle. They were found in New York and were thought to be extirpated. Both of those have varying levels of threatened and endangered statuses in different states. And I believe the nine spotted is also federally endangered. Um, but they, they are in New York. It hasn't seemed like they're here. We haven't found any yet, but that's what we're gonna be focusing on this summer is trying to turn them up. And I can pull up um, a page that has most of the species that are still missing and share it. Okay. There we go. So here's that nine spotted lady beetle that I was talking about. These spots again, sometimes they're really clear, other times they're barely there to spotless. The two spotted lady beetle can also be kind of inverted in how it looks. It can be entirely black with red spots. Um, we found those. This one is still missing, the transverse lady beetle. We have a couple really tiny guys that are still missing, both the firefly duskyling and the undulate single lady beetle, along with the glacial, the five spotted, that's the migratory one right there, the 13 spotted, the esteemed, and then this skymus species that does not have a common name which I may have found one or two of on Mansfield this summer. I personally don't like taking, like killing insects to take them back and identify them. Um, and you can't really identify them from photos. So it could have been that species, but it also might've been a different Skymus species. So that one is an undetermined level of missing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there, are there any specific native plants that can be grown by gardeners to help native species or ways to build attractive habitat for them? Yeah, that's a really great question. So uh, lady beetles seem to be attracted to the color yellow. Um, so planting yellow flowers that are shallow, so like sunflowers or 
you know, something similar to daisies, those sort of like flat topped flowers or flowers with umbils, the kind of multiple little flowers that are all kind of grouped together like a broccoli head. Um, those are really good flowers to plant. Some species like the spotted lady beetle actually eat a lot of pollen. Um, so those will be like very much attracted in. Um, that said, honestly, lady beetles are more attracted to areas based on the larger landscape structure than they are to individual gardens. So if you're say living in a very populous city and you have a very sad garden, but it is the only green space in your area, you're going to have a lot of lady beetles, whether it's prime habitat or not, versus, you know, you could have this beautiful garden and be out in the middle of this, like, you know, uh, relatively monoculture woods, and you won't have very many lady beetles because you're in a more natural space, but you have more of a monoculture surrounding your small plot. So they'll just be elsewhere in the landscape. But for your small garden um, or large space, um, having a variety of structure, vegetative structures, so having trees and shrubs and herbaceous species is kind of the best way to attract them because we have a ton of different native species and they all kind of use different vegetative structures. Also ensuring if you're on land that has trees that you leave standing dead and down woody debris because a lot of lady beetles will overwinter using those. That's also really helpful um, for grassy areas. If you can leave areas that you don't mow until it's winter time, that's a really good way of providing habitat for them and other insect species along with bobolinks if there's enough grass. Um, yeah. Right. Thank you. I think that yeah. was the last question. I think so too. Um, we have a little bit of time. So do you want to share your screen, Julia, and just show folks? Sure. <laughs> All righty, so okay, so this is your iNaturalist homepage once you have an account set up, and just a couple quick feature overviews that are helpful. On your explore page, you can filter to a region and you get a list of all of the observations, all of the species, all of the people that have been identifying observations and observing these organisms on a map. You can also toggle over to grid and see all of the photos and audio recordings of the different species. And this is just in the state of Vermont. So iNaturalist has become a pretty, a pretty powerful platform. Um, and basically, again, with kind of how things become research grade and why that matters. So you see here, there's an observation of a tufted titmouse. <clears throat> this photo was uploaded with a location which you can see that this is blue and I can't really, uh, and then, oops, sorry. And then when I zoom in, there's a circle, a dark blue circle around where this pin is. Basically what this means is that this observer obscured their exact observation location, which is something you can do. So say you're recording species at your house and don't want people to know your actual location, you can just obscure the geo privacy and that's totally fine. But you can see that there is a location, there's a date when this was observed, and there is a photo that is relatively clear so it can be identified. And then you see here the user identified this as a tufted titmouse. And all of these people have agreed you just click agree if that's a correct identification. And you can see because there is two thirds 
community agreement, it is research grade. And when an observation becomes research grade, it gets pulled into other biodiversity data platforms, such as GBIF or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which then funnels into the Vermont Atlas of Life. And basically, these observations becoming research grade is like a crowdsource quality control, ensuring that observations are as correctly identified as they can be instead of, you know, people uploading an observation with a guest because they're not sure yet what the species is and that unchecked data getting pulled into GBIF. So that's why research grade matters. And how you upload. So there are also mobile apps, which I can talk about briefly too. I personally prefer the computer version because it's much more user-friendly and you can upload a lot more photos at once. So I'll just download photos from my phone to my computer um, and then upload from there. But if you only have a phone, that's perfectly fine. You just have to go like one photo at a time. So you click upload and then navigate to your files. And once you're in here, you can upload a batch of photos all at once. So I will say these are the ones that I need to upload. You single click on the first photo that you want to upload, hold shift down on your keyboard, single click the last photo you want to upload, and then click open. And now my computer will slowly think about loading these. All right, and now you can see each photo has uploaded on an individual, I call this a plate, um, this white rectangle that has species name, the date, the location, and space for notes. But you can see here, I have multiple photos of the same individual, and I do not want to upload those like this, because that would then be indicating to iNaturalist that it's a separate photo of a separate individual. And since these are all the same, I want them to be in the same observation. So again, just hold down shift on your keyboard and select all of the photos that you want to combine into one observation. And then simply click combine at the top. And now you can see all nine of those photos of this wasp are in one observation. From here, when you want to enter the species name, iNaturalist will give you suggestions based on artificial intelligence from other observations that have been uploaded with species such as birds that a lot of people are photographing. The AI is quite good. Um, with species that are less observed, like lady beetles, it's less good. Um, so basically here, this is actually correct. It is a dark paper wasp, so I can just select that. But uh, say for example, every time I upload photos of 14 spotted lady beetles in a scintillation vial, iNaturalist identifies them as spot croakers. I don't know why. Um, that obviously is not correct, but if I didn't know what that beetle was, I could either just say insects, or if I knew it was a lady beetle, I could just put down lady beetles. And then once you upload, other users will help you identify it down to the species level. One other thing of note here is you can edit multiple photos or multiple observations if they're made at the same location. So you can either click select all or do the holding shift down on your keyboard and single clicking on each one that you want to edit at the same time. You can see here, I can now edit multiple species, edit multiple dates, and the locations. And since I had my location turned on on my phone, it automatically generated the GPS point of each of these photos. And then another thing right now, you can see my location is public. 
but if you want to obscure your location or make it private, you can do that. Um, the difference between obscured and private is if it's obscured, you are able to easily still share the specific location data with people who are coordinating projects that you join. So for example, the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. Um, if you make it private, it's much harder for um, people coordinating projects that you join to get the actual location of where you are observing that species and obscuring it works just as well. Um, so I would personally recommend that. And basically once you are done, you just click submit and your observations will all upload onto your dashboard. Are there any questions here? I know I just threw a lot of information at everyone. Well, that was really clear. It's a great platform. Yeah, I've actually never used the computer version. I've only used my phone. So this is really interesting to see. Yeah, it definitely, if if possible to view iNaturalist on a computer, I recommend it so much more over the app or even if you're on your phone and you have access to Wi-Fi, um, just going on the web browser version of iNaturalist on your phone, if you want to explore things, it's just infinitely better. The apps are a little bit difficult to navigate. The final thing I'll talk about here, and then I'll just screen share some screen captures of what the app looks like. Um, it's the same process, you know, it's just shuffled a little bit to fit on your phone screen better. But iNaturalist also has projects. So for example, we have, oh, I guess I'll just have to search it. So we have the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas here. And this, the way this project is formatted is it's essentially like the explore page that I showed you um, when I first pulled up iNaturalist with a specific filtered search put on it. So every time this page is loaded, it just curates all of the observations that fit the requirement of being in the Lady Beetle family or Coxinellidae within the state boundaries of Vermont, and it pulls them up here. And this just kind of gives you a nice platform to show you all of the kind of fast stats of the project. Um, so you have observations, species, most observed species. You can see the recent observations or click through here to see um, a pull up of all of the species or observations or et cetera here. And this is a nice look of all of the species that we found in the state so far. These are the really hard to identify ones because they're all tiny and look the same. <laughs> so yeah. I do have one, oh, one go question ahead. just come to mind. I noticed that the examples on iNaturalist that you're sharing show some pretty common species. So how how do you decide whether to report common species versus ones that are less common that might be notable in terms of just rediscovering in a species that hasn't been seen in a long time or um, is rare? Definitely. So I personally, with if you're participating in a project like the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, all data is valuable data, even if you only find really common species or if you find no species, just sending an email even being like, I was surveying this place at this time and found no beetles. That is all helpful. Um, so I personally would say, if it looks like a lady beetle and you want to participate in this, still photograph it and upload it to iNaturalist. Um, but really the, the common one that you could exclude and that's pretty easy to identify is the Asian lady beetle, which will be 
well, actually they can also sometimes be um, fully black with red spots, but usually the ones here are red with either black spots or sometimes no spots, have this white pronotum with this distinctive M shape on the pronotum in black. Um, but I'd honestly say whatever you see, still photograph it and upload it, even if it's the like, you know, 10th one that you've seen that day. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then just looking at the app quickly, oops. These are some screen captures of it. You can see the explore page automatically takes you to a map, which is same thing as the iNaturalist platform. You can still see all of your content, both those that are identifying things for you and just your observations, along with the ability to, by clicking observe here, you can upload either directly from your camera or you can take a bunch of photos and then upload them from your camera roll, roll which I personally prefer because iNaturalist in the app only lets you take one photo at a time. And if it's a quick moving critter, it's better to just use your camera app and then upload whatever you get later. And that is what I have for you all today. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. And if anyone has any further questions, I'm happy to answer them or we can call it an evening. Yeah, people in the chat are just thanking you. Um, for your answers and the information. And I will um, send out any info that you send to me, Julia, tomorrow. Sounds good. All right. Have a good night, everyone. You, you too. too. Bye. Bye.